Hi, Andy. Thank you for coming on the podcast. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Are you? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so we'll just get straight into it. How old were you when you started playing football? Um, I started as a kid, really. You know, you just play at school and, you know, you kind of just playing for fun and working your way through. So, realistically, you know, I can remember playing at first school. Um, back in them days, obviously, we had three, um, you know, schools which we went to, but first school, I remember playing in the playground with my mates and, you know, and things like that, playing in the, in, you know, in teams and things there. So, you know, I've always played, you know, from very, very young age, really, um, right through, obviously, till, you know, the end of my career as such. But um, it was always something for fun and, you know, I enjoyed it. So that's, uh, you know, you played with your mates in the playground every, you know, every break and, you know, you kind of potentially got better and better and better and played in the teams and worked your way up from there, really. You said it was fun uh... Is that all it was, or did you want to become a professional footballer? Uh, I never really thought about being a professional footballer, I don't think, till I was maybe 14, 15 or something. Um, it's totally different now to how people, you know, react and things. I think everybody wants to be a professional footballer now. And, you know, kids see the, you know, the rewards which the, the top, top players get. Um, and they want a little bit of that. And a lot of people, you know, that's their that's their goal and ambition and you know for me I, I played a lot of sports and and you know football really wasn't my number one sport was badminton really I was I was better at badminton than I was at football and got told to to pack up football to play badminton at a at England level and uh, I, I I didn't do that because I enjoyed both and I wanted to play both and um you know that was 14 15 and I'd signed schoolboy forms at 14 was which was the earliest we could do and you know, it, it wasn't really thoughtful as a career. And then I, I suppose at 15, I kind of thought, well, actually, I want to be an apprentice. I want to see how far I can go. And, you know, I ended up playing at 15. I played in a, a reserve game at Huddersfield away. And, and they had, uh, we, you know, we had, you know, Bobby Davis and playing, Mervyn Day playing, you know, for us. And, um, you know, they had Peter Jackson playing, who was their, you know, Huddersfield captain. And, you know, I played really well and, you know, I kind of thought, like, yeah, actually, I, I think I could, I, I kind of fancy a little bit of this, but there was no real money in it then and Leeds wasn't, you know, for instance, Leeds weren't in the in the top division then either. They were in the in, in, in the second division at that point, Um, you know. So, yeah, it was something which I suppose came in the back of your mind at 15, 16, but that was, that was all it kind of came to. But, yeah, it was fun. It was, I enjoyed it. It was, but I enjoy every sport and, and still play lots of sport now. So f- sport in general, it was something for for me to to be involved with, and football was was one of them really. Yeah. How old were you when you joined Leeds? So we could only we could only join at fourteen. So we, the, the earliest we could, you know, join a, a football club at that age was fourteen. Um, so I signed at fourteen, and then you know you got a two year contract. Fifteen, you were playing on Sunday Sunday games, which was against other teams. Um, locally, so your Bradford, your Sheffield United, your Sheffield Wednesdays, um, and then I was, uh, you know, I wasn't in the in the you know the Yorkshire Yorkshire team or anything else like that. I'll, it was a kid from from the Leeds team who was in that, um, and he was also an apprentice. He was also a schoolboy at that point as well at Leeds, and I played every game at right back um, under uh, the, when when we were under 15s playing on 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 the Sundays. I was still trying to play badminton as well at the time. Um, and then, uh, you know, yeah, I, I played that game, as I mentioned earlier on against Huddersfield and kind of came off thinking, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm in a decent position here to get a, an apprenticeship. And, uh, I can remember coming home from school one day and, um, there was a, a letter from Leeds United, which was there. And, you know, that was the, um, the time really when it was like, right, you know, we, we, this is kind of what your next step would be really as an apprentice. And and that's I got me apprenticeship and um I played uh, I played most games then from you know from being an apprentice all the way through. I, I, I kind of played, you know, a lot of games in that time and, you know, came came through in, you know, to to luckily get a pro contract at um, you know, at, well at seventeen, I think it was March, you know, I was a bit early with three, with with two of the other lads. So yeah, it was it was something which you kind of you know you're trying to to get into, and then once you get into the apprenticeship side of things, you kind of think, well, actually, now we're you know we we kind of you know we are here to play um, football, and we, it's a job, and it's it's a lifestyle, and it's something that you have to you know you have to do really. Kids nowadays join football teams a lot younger than fourteen. Is there a lot of pressure on them? 
I think there's a lot of pressure on them. I think they put the pressure on themselves. I think some of the parents possibly put the pressure on them as well. Um, you know, as I said before, I think, you know, kids nowadays, they, they see the, the fruits of what, you know, some of the uh, the top, top players are getting and, and being in the premiership. But the realism is that there's only maybe 1% of people going to play in a first team um, in a professional football club. Um and I think that I think it's important. I think when when we were apprentices, we were, you know, we had to go to college every Thursday, and we we did a, a college course. Which, you know, I think I I do believe that all footballers now should have a, a trade of some sort, which they do when they're sixteen to eighteen. Um, you know, they've got to be a bit more academic than what we used to have to be. Um, but I think they should have a trade of some sort, an electrician or a joiner or a plumber or something like that, because. You know, you never know when it's going to stop. You never know when it's going to finish. And and you're in a bubble when you're playing football and you think that you're always going to be a professional footballer and you always think that that's your job till, till really, till you're 33, 35 year old, that's going to be your job. And and the realism is that it's it's possibly not going to be your job and you're going to have to go find something else to do at, um, at 18, 19, 20, 21 now. You know, they've got the under 23s now, which... You know, I kind of disagree with to a certain point, but I'm I'm sure we'll go on to that later on. But you know, you kind of think that you know nowadays it's um you know you, you've got to have something else in the background just to you know just to kind of make sure that you've you've got a job when you come out of football because it's very difficult because you live in a bubble when you're in in the football world, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got to talk about that FA Cup uh, Youth Cup against Manchester United. What were them two games like for you? It was fantastic. Obviously, it's something which a lot of people ask us about now, and and it's the first thing which people come to us for. To be fair, um, you know the the first game we you know we we played against Norwich in the semi final, which we knew was going to be a tough game. Um, that was over two legs, and we knew that was going to be tough because they they had a couple of players, um, well three really, which people will, will know, which is you know Darren Eady was in main main one. Um, Akin Baye played up front, who was a bit of a, a an ox, and Jamie Curtin, who was scoring loads of goals. So we knew it was always going to be difficult um, against them. And, and to be honest, we didn't even think of the final at all. You know, we we, we didn't think that we, you know, we, we'd play Man United. And then obviously the final came about, and it was against our arch rivals. And um, you know, we went down to to Old Trafford first, and we knew they had a, a good squad, and we knew that they had players who were known I suppose within the football or the younger football generation of the things but we also had them as well you know we had you know Kevin Sharp Jamie Forrester Mark Tinkler who, who all played for England at that that level you know they had you know Nicky but Paul Scholes you know the, you can kind of go through all the all the players as such but I suppose the people who were playing for England at that time at that time were more people from Leeds um, but we also knew that they had a you know, the class of 92, which they keep calling themselves, you know, the class of 92 really was only Ryan Giggs in there. The rest of them were all the, you know, the the, the first year apprentices, second year apprentices, which went through to, to be the, you know, the legends they are and the fantastic players and, and, and gone on and, and done great things in football. And, and they are, you know, you look at David Beckham now, you'd never think that, you know, Bex would be, uh, you know, this worldwide legend around and not just football, but in in general, um, you would never have thought that at the time. But their team was was frightening, really. Um, you can reel them off. The Nevilles played. Cas- Chris Casper played. Phil O'Kane played. You know, you've got Keith Gillespie, Paul Scholes, David Beckham, Nicky Butt, Ben Thornley, Robbie Savage. You know, they they, they had a a very, very, very good team. And uh, you know, to be fair, we went to Old Trafford and we beat them down at Old Trafford. Um, quite convincingly, to be honest. Um, yeah. as well, we had thirty-one thousand. I think it was down there, thirty, thirty-one thousand at Old Trafford. Um, which was fantastic for 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 us as kids because we didn't really expect that. We have to say. Um, and then when we came back to all uh, to to Ellen Road from Old Trafford, we we had a very short break in between the two games, and um. You know, we came in and obviously none of us really drove. And we we went to a, a, one of the lads' houses, Dave Connor's house. There was about five of us went there who lived in Morley and his mum made us all our pre-match. And we got on the bus to come back down and, you know, we were like, oh, bloody hell, it's busy down here. <laughs> um, you know, it was, it was packed and we were like, yeah. God. And it was the first time that the, the big stand, as we call it, was open and they had to open that up. And, you know, we had... Um, 
yeah, with 15, 20 minute delay on, on, on the game. And we had, um, 33 and a half, 33,000 there. So it was unbelievable. And the atmosphere was, was fantastic. We, you know, back in those days, we had a, there was a lot of camaraderie between all the players. And I know there's camaraderie now between them, but like, you know, back then we had every single first team player was, was at that game. Um, oh, yeah. Obviously, Sky was. It was the first time Sky had, I think, had uh, televised any any game as well for a, for a youth team, um, yeah. uh, youth cup final. So we, you know, I think Gary Mack was in the was in the studio then, and they had a, there was a, a Man United man there as well. I can't remember who that was, but you know, Gary McAllister was the captain of the football club, and and you know he's he's there, and Gordon Strachan was there, and it was it was fantastic, really. Um, and we got off to a great start because Jamie, you know, Jamie Forrester scored the, you know, the overhead kick, which everybody remembers. And, you know, Matty Smith had scored the the second. And then Scholes, he did his, uh, his old uh, hands to the ears to the cop when he scored his penalty, you know. And it, it, I think, I don't think they've forgotten that one, to be fair. But, <laughs> um, you know, I think he he now realises that, that that might not have been the uh, the best thing to do for for him in that career, but it just shows what kind of players they were. And, and they were very confident and very, you know, thought they would go on and win that. Um, but we battered them really over two legs. We absolutely battered them. Uh, and it might have been physically from our point of view, they were maybe technically better than us and, and they were still growing. But I still feel that, you know, technically we were, we were very good as well as a, as a team. We were very good. Um, but we were a team and we were and we beat them up basically. We beat them up over two legs and we beat them four one. Um over those two legs. We did a couple of laps of honour and you know, we I can remember coming in after them. We had uh, there was beers and the all the first teamers were there and everything else. And the first teamers then took us out into town and and things. So yeah, we, we were we were tripped by like kings that um you know, that after that game and it was it's something which everybody comes back to us now and says, you know, about it and they and they say oh were you involved with that the youth cup game and yeah we were the original youth cup winners i suppose um the next lot which came through were you know was obviously wood gates and your your robinsons and and, yeah. and mcphails and things they came through which um again was fantastic you know for them to go but then again you you, you look at the the crowds ever since that that game it's never been anything like the crowd which we got and i don't think it ever will be to be honest with you no, no. Did having big crowds in them games help you when you became a professional in some sense? Because you knew what to expect. Uh, yes and no. It, it, to be honest, it doesn't really... Because we used to be ball boys anyhow. Um, so we were used to be... You know, we, that was our part of our jobs as being apprentices. So we would be... Um, I can remember playing against Man United and, and we'd, we we went ahead in the first half and I can't remember who scored, but I, I actually used to ball boy in front of the away fans yeah that was my little spot um and I jumped up and cheered when we scored and uh I think I made double my wages that that uh that week because the coins and everything else being thrown at <laughs> the Man United fans um so you know you kind of you kind of get used to it a little bit obviously you, you, you know you're on the side of the pitch and if the ball comes to you obviously you're passing it in or you you know you're throwing it in or you're kind of used to it but you kind of because you're around it it's just natural it, it, it's you know it's what you're planning to to be um to be a pro is is a professional footballer and your dream is to be out on that pitch and it sounds strange and a lot of people will say it but you don't when you do make your debut you don't really hear any of the noise there's not you don't really hear what's going on in the crowds when there's when there's forty thousand you know people there when there's two thousand people there you hear every word but when there's forty thousand people there you really don't hear that much to be perfectly honest with you um but it's what you've been dreaming of and it's what you've been working towards it's it's like anybody you know somebody in a an ordinary office job wanting to go forward and, and move up in their life and, and suddenly they're the one taking the 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 board meeting or something like that you're kind of going well how have I got into it's just a natural progression which happens and I think you know, they gear you into that now as well. And, and because they are eight, nine year olds and they're working their way up and they're involved with that, that club and so on. And I think that, um, you know, us as 14, 15 year olds, we're always involved with the club in that sense. And we're always involved with the first team and the, and the, and the match days in particular, um, and quite close to the match days. And I think that kind of, you know, does help you in, in making it, but it doesn't really, it, you don't really think about it. It's just natural. It's a natural thing you're trying to 
achieve and it's you know you, your end goal is to play in the first team and when you're playing in the reserves and you're playing against the likes of you know Roy Keane, Brian McClare, you know Brian Robson for against Man United or Dean Dublin or whoever it will be in them back in those days um you know you're playing against the people you'd be playing against in the first team anyhow because they're coming back from injury so you kind of get used to it a little bit i suppose is the is the easiest way to explain it and you don't really think about it until after you've finished and you kind of think oh yeah i played in front of 35,000 70,000 at Old Trafford or 25,000 at you know, whatever. And, and you don't really think about that until it's actually finished, to be honest, because it is just a natural progression of, of going through, you know, your footballing career. It's what you're, what you're dreaming of, really. Yeah. Um, in March 1995, you made your senior debut for Leeds against Coventry. What was that like? Yeah, it was a good, it was a, it was a strange week, really, because we played against um, Notts Forest in the reserves. I was captain of the reserves and I, we, we played against Nottingham Forest, I think a couple of times in that week. And after, I, there was a rumour that I might have been going to, to Forest at the time um, as well. Um, so that's kind of... Um, just Sorry, I've got somebody else ringing me through on my phone. I might have just disappeared for a minute. No. Um, but you, you kind of go to... Um, you know, you go to Forest and you come back and you do everything which is, um, you know, going from there. And it, it didn't happen uh, for obvious reasons. And then... I got wind of uh, we played against Forest on the Tuesday, and I got a I was sponsored by Mizuno at the time, and I got a massive bag of free stuff. So I'm kind of thinking I must be pretty close. I've been in a few of the, um, you know, a few of the the, the squads and travelling squads and things. Um, but it was the first time to be on the bench, and you know, unfortunate for for Lucas uh, Redebi, you know, the chief, he um, he did his cruciate ligaments, so it was out for. a a while and you know I got on quite early to be honest I got in after about, about 20 minutes I think it was I came on and you know we ended up winning the game and and Strack was um you know man of the match and he went up and uh, you know after the game and I was just sat there kind of I suppose just kind of you know sat in the dressing room on my own a little bit taking it all in um you know after and he just came up and sat next to me and said you you were brilliant today you know you've done really really well and and you know give you give you the the captain's kind of tap and, and you know and you were kind of oh, I, fair enough and I ended up playing then the next game against against Forest um, but then moved to I was played centre half actually against Coventry which was I was actually playing centre half for the reserves at that time yeah and uh, you know I was a right back when I first came in I ended up moving into into midfield for the Forest game and you know my, my full, first full debut I suppose and um, it didn't go to plan we got beat um, they had a very good team. Brian Roy, in particular, Stan Collimo, um, Lars Bohinian. You know, they they really did have a good team in there. And Brian Roy was somebody who the gaff was a little bit uh, kind of concerned about. You know, coming off the back four and coming into midfield. So I was that person to try and get hold of him. And you know, at half time, I, I there was a a bit of an altercation between me and John Pemberton, and um, the gaffer just let it go. And, you know, I'm only a young kid at this time, you know, realistically m making me way. And Pembo was a, a bit of a experienced pro and giving me, uh, giving me 10 to the dozen, uh, you know, it was my fault for, for one of the goals and all that kind of stuff. And the gaffer just let it run. And David Weatherall, you know, came in and kind of, you know, cause you've got to stick up for yourself, you know, you're, you're yeah. in a man's, you're in a man's world. And this is what you kind of learn when you, uh, when you're playing in reserve team football and, you know, we, uh, which is, there's a story which kind of makes me come back to this a little bit. And and basically, I, I, you know, Dave Weatherall split us up a little bit and sat us down and the gaffer went, no, because he's right, Pembo, you were wrong. And he backed me up and didn't go with him. And I think, you know, you've got to, you've as I say, you, you've got to be, you've got to be good in your own mind of what you've done and, and you've got to be confident and you've got to be a man very, very quickly. Um, and how I kind of get that was we played a game in a reserve game. We had Gordon Strachan playing in midfield. As I say, I was the captain of the reserves and Strack was playing and Kevin Sharp was playing. And them two had a, a bit of a fisticuff really halfway through the 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 first half. And uh, so I'm like shouting at them to, to get on with it and whatever. But then as I was, as I was coming off, me Kennigan basically said to me, he says, you've got to sort them two out when you get into that changing room. Who was who was obviously the the assistant manager, 
And uh, I said, but I can't. He's he's the club captain. He's got a strike. I can't. I can't give him a rollicking. And he goes, "You're the captain. You need to go in there." So I went in and I said, "What?" Well, basically, had a go at both of them and said to Strike, "I said you should know more. You should know better than than to be doing something like that on the football pitch." And it was a bit of a test, a little bit. I think. Um, you feel- they're, 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 they're bit together wasn't a test. They they that's what they were doing. But yeah, I think yeah. For, but for, for Mick and the manager and everybody else, it was a bit of a test on, on my character, I suppose. And, you know, it, you kind of learn, as I say, you learn very quickly. I would have been, what, 18, 19 at that point. And, um, you know, you te- you, you're telling somebody who's a legend within the football club and the club captain, you know, to, to pipe down a little bit and you're out of order. Um, and then one of your mates, you're telling you're out of order. You know, this yeah. would be, if you're going to do something like that, do it in the dressing room, don't do it on the pitch. Um, so it kind of fits you in a little bit easier um, on that side of it. And, you know, you, you go into the first team and the first team is is ruthless. You know, everybody wants your position. Um, if you make a mistake, you you know, you're punished for it. And and that's kind of what Premier League football is. Uh, you know, and we, we got beat there and I went to Old Trafford. We played the next game at Old Trafford. Um when Blackburn won the league, we got a draw down there. It was nil nil, um, sunny afternoon, and um, yeah, that was the kind of the start of of my first team kind of career, really. I suppose in that sense. Just to go back to with Strachan, do you think he respected you more for sticking like standing your ground with him? Yeah, I think so. I think you know, I think the I think the respect was already there. To be honest with you, I think everybody respects everybody, and you know the respect is there, and 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 he. He was somebody who um, I kind of looked up to a lot as well. Um, you know, from a young age, we he came in when he was coming to the end of his career. He kind of brought all the younger lads in to, you know, to extra training. And I think that brought me on massively. Uh, and I was gutted when he left and went to Coventry, to be perfectly honest with you, because I think I was getting better and better through, you know, through that. And... Um, yeah, I think I think they just I think there's just respect from from all angles. Just generally, if you had a bed bad egg, then the respect obviously disappears. But you earn your respect, and you earn you earn that within your dressing room, and you earn the right to be able to say what you want to say within the dressing room as well. And I think that's the um, I think that's the, the the side of it which you I think that's missing now. I think that's just. I think that's just something. I think there are a lot of robots in football now, and I think there's no characters in football anymore. And I, the, the, there's not a Vieira and a and a Keane, which is your your automatic one, which comes up. You know, um, there's none of that rivalry anymore, and there's none of that. I think players are scared maybe to say something to one of their mates or to to somebody because they are very robotic. They have every bit of information in front of them. Um, you know, and I think that's that's a difficult situation for players potentially to be in who are them characters who want to come in and say something or or something like that. You know, I'm sure it still happens, but I, I, I'm pretty sure there's no there's no fisticuffs at half times. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's no pinning people up against walls at half times as much as what they used to be back in back in the day because you would be you would be you would be outed as being it's your fault. You're supposed to be marking them. You're supposed to be with them. You're supposed to be you know you stick with your runner and and so on and and you would be pinpointed. You know, for that, I think the older pros, some older pros, I had it up at Carlisle. There was an older pro up there who, who who wanted to put his authority on the younger kids, and you know, it was it was wrong. Um, and I stuck up for the younger kids because I was still a young kid myself. But you know, I'd come from Leeds and and come from a situation where I kind of felt that he was he was being totally bang out of order with with them, and I told him. Um, that was detriment to me to a certain point um, because he was somebody who was quite influential within the football club, you know, higher up in, in that side of it. Um, but, you know, you, you, you've got to believe in your, in, in what you, what you believe in. And you've got to, if you feel something's wrong, then you need to go and knock on the door. Um, we had this conversation this week with, with Willie Nonto, to be fair, it was, you know, he, he can't in any other club, he'd be going and knocking on the door at the minute because he wants to be playing football. But, we're in such a good position that we've got people who are playing really, really well, Dan James yeah. and, and Somerville, um, that he can't go and knock on the door because they're not, he, he can't out them, you know, for, for their position because they're playing fantastic football at the minute. Um, 
you know, and we would do that. If I was dropped on a Saturday, for instance, and I played well or whatever, you'd, you'd go and knock on the door as the, the manager and ask why that would be. You would also be wanting an explanation why you're not playing to a certain point sometimes. Um, you know, and I don't think that happens now. I think the, the game's changed a lot and I think the managers now have have more uh, man management of egos than than certainly what than what we had really back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Did you always know that Stracker was going to go on and become a manager? I think he always had that character. I think he, he was always the... Um, you know, every time you see him now, he's still called Skip. He's, he, he he was the skipper. He was the captain. He was the the man every looked up to, um, and rightly so. You know, he, he, when he came in, he transformed. You know, the football club in lots of different ways. Um, he had an authority about him, but also he did it on the football pitch. Um, you know, and he, one word which we use a lot. Um, you know, now or, or sentence we use a lot. He said, "If you're having a bad game, doesn't stop you running around." Yeah, uh, and that was kind of how he looked at it. If you were having a bad game, run around, go win the ball, pass it to somebody who's having a good game, and that epitified really what Gordon Strachan was. You know, he was hundred percent every single game. You knew exactly what you were getting. Um, and don't get me wrong, you know, he, he could be nasty as well at the same time. You know, and that's that's part of what you need to be. Um, you know, within it, but he was, he was possibly the key signing, you know, for, for us at that point when he came in and um, he saw the project Howard Wilkinson wanted and um, he fully went on board with that project. And, uh, you know, he was as much a success uh, to the success of Leeds United to, to, with Howard, really, with 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 getting us to the, to winning the league, getting us up into the, into the championship as it was then and, you know, winning the league and and moving the club forward in that sense, bringing people in and and he's still, you know, even when we brought like David Rockcastle in and 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 people like that, he was still in front of them. He was still looking after his nutrition, looking after him, you know, drinking wise, looking after his, himself in lots of different ways. And by looking after himself in that way, he, he prolonged his career. And I think a lot of the players saw that, and you know. People like Gary Speed and Gary McAllister, you know, were really good friends with him, and, and they jumped on that as well. And they were like, well, "If he's doing it and he's still going at that level, we need to keep, we need to do that as well." Um, and as I say, that from my point of view, we didn't see that much of him with him because there was the first team dressing room and the reserve dressing room as such. So we didn't really see that within the dressing room until we were on away trips or or something like that. But you know, yeah, he was a massive influence in that football club, and you know, he was a, a big influence on a lot of. Uh, a lot of the main pros as well who were playing, you know, first teamers at that point as well. Yeah. You mentioned before that you played at Old Trafford in the Premier League. What was that game like? Obviously, we being rivaled. It, yeah, it was boiling hot. It was pretty crap, to be fair. We, we drew nil-nil. Um, you know, we uh, the best bit about it, really, I suppose, is Blackburn went and won the league by a couple of points or whatever. And we kind of feel that, you know, we, we, we helped that because obviously it was coming into the end of the season when we went in there. But... Um, yeah, look, you go in there and it's it's, only, it's another football ground. That's yeah, it's not. You know, the rivalry's there and the and the and the bitterness a little bit of what we what we don't like about each other um, is there on the pitch. Um, the rivalry is there at reserve team football, youth team football. It, it's there full stop. So you kind of feel that when you're going in, um, but you've got you know seventy thousand people there um, but there's no atmosphere at Old Trafford is there it's, it, it, there isn't it, you know but I think I think I think Roy Keane was absolutely right what he said about the prawn, prawn sandwich brigade you know yeah, yeah. You, go, you go to Ellen Road you never see a phone in sight when we score you go to Old Trafford you, you, know, you see pictures of Old Trafford it's like phone, phone left right and centre um, and I think that that was kind of the thing there it wasn't the, you know I was involved with the Leeds and uh, Leeds at Ellen Road clash as well. I didn't play, but I was I was on the bench and things. And it's a totally different atmosphere at Ellen Road than it is at um, you know, Old Trafford, you know, seventy thousand people, but you don't really know what's anything else really. But yeah, it look it, we got a draw and we we could have won. They could have won. Um it was live on Sky and everything else. So it was it was it was good. It was uh is Old Trafford somewhere you always want to play? No. Um it's never been anywhere on my 
wish list of, of of football places to go and play at all. It's it just isn't, um, you know. But it's uh, you know the uh, you know going into it. Yes, it's a bit more hostile. Coming out of it, it's a bit more hostile um, than other places. But you know, to be honest, it's it's just another football match. You know, we go there and we play and we we want to get a result. Um, and that was the be and end all for us. We you know we were wanting to get the three points and how how we would go about that was was set out. We knew we were going to be playing the day before. So yes, I've got all my family there and all that kind of stuff. So that's always good. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, the disappointing bit is we didn't get three points, but we did get a draw, which potentially made them, you know, not win the league and Blackburn win the league. And and that's, that's better for us than it is, um, you know, than, than anything else to be fair. But yeah, it's look, it, Old Trafford's a big stadium. It's, it's got the most amount of people, you know, people in there and everything else. But as I said before at the start, you, you you don't think about how many people are there. You don't think about the noise. You don't really kind of, you know, look at that. The only thing which I can remember is when we came out to to walk on the pitch to start, um, you know, just having a, a, a pre-match, you know, kind of look and see what boots we're going to be wearing and all that kind of stuff, was that the the, the sheer size of the, the, the new stand that just put up, and it was massive, and you did think that, you know, when you were there. But then, once you start playing, you you, you don't really think of any of that. You don't look at any of that, um, you know, side of it. To be honest, yeah. You just, yeah. totally, yeah, yeah, totally. You don't, you know, you don't have any, you don't have any thought of anybody in the crowd or how many people are here or Sky or or anything else like that. You don't have any kind of recollection of that, really. You don't really think of it until again, until after your career, really. To be honest, well, you've mentioned. Uh... Strachan, McAllister, Speed, and he played with a lot of big players at Leeds. What was it like being in that squad? Um, it was great fun. It, it, it you know, it, we had characters. We had, um, we're still friends now. We're all, we have a WhatsApp group which we all we all speak. Um, a real camaraderie with, with, with people from that era. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, in the dressing room on the in the. You know, the young lads kind of, there was a few of us who came in. There was me, there was Mark Ford, there was No Whelan, there was um, Kev Sharp, Jamie Forrester. We were all kind of, and Tinks were all involved with the first team squads when we were leaving. But a lot of times we never realised, we, we never, we were never going to be playing as such. You know, the European nights, we, we knew we'd generally be on the bench because um, we had five subs on the bench, but we only had two subs back then, really. Um, two subs and a keeper and, you know, we, you didn't really get close to the first team in that sense, unless you were really, you were playing. Um, but we, we used to travel, I think it was 19 to 20 people used to travel um, to every game. So we're always on the buses going down and the young lads really, to be fair, we mucked in with Sean, who's um, the kit man and we, we, we sorted the kits out and we helped with all that side of it, you know, transporting things in and out and all that kind of stuff. And again, I go back to, that was our upbringing, a little bit of being apprentices. That's what we had to do. Um, but look, there's some real characters. We had some really good trips. We had, we had, you know, Gary Speed. You know, was was unbelievable. Really, he was such a a nice guy. Um, what a player. Um, but yeah, on a night out, he'd be the one who'd, who'd look after us. Um, you know, we we we'd go away and end of season trips and things. He'd make sure all the lads are all right, and he'd be the one who's the spokesperson a little bit of going, look, we need to look after the young boys or whatever it will be. So yeah, look, it's. It's great, but that kind of era, it can, my era coming in, you know, Bats are just just about to leave. Um, he then went to Blackburn. You know, then there was a, a talk of Gary Mack potentially going. There was talk of Strack potentially looking at going as well, you know, going into management and things. You know, Speedo, there was always talk about him going. And there was the young lads, the next generation, I suppose, of us coming through. And, you know, once, um, you, know, how, you know, Howard had brought in, Lee Boyu and it, that was the kind of the, the changeover a little bit you know there was Lee Boyu came in we played against you know Lee Sharp came in Ian Rush came in and um, you know there was a change of the guard a little bit and uh, you know the first game we played that season was against Derby away and and I was playing me Ford and, and, and Lee Boyu were, were playing and you know we kind of got told before the game that we would be you know the first t- first choices for the midfield really this year looking going forward but then you know football's ruthless and I mean obviously Howard got the sack after five or six games I think it was when we got beat 4-0 against Man United I think it was 
And um, he got the sack, and then Gorgeous George came in and and kind of, you know, had a different view and a different way of of wanting to play and a different kind of um, players he wanted to use, I suppose. Um, which was I was part of for the first eight or nine games. Um, you know, under him, I played every game and scored against Coventry in the first ninety seconds of his his tenure as such. So you know, did all right. And then you know, George kind of changed a little bit. He wanted he 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 wanted us to be very much a um, an Arsenal way of playing. I suppose is the best way to describe it. He wanted us to play like them. Um, and he 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 was very defensive. Um. Obviously, David O'Leary came in underneath him for a little bit. Eddie Gray was part of that backroom team um, in the early days. And then Paddy came in and, and, and came into there. And, and Paddy, obviously, you know, when George Graham went, he, he definitely brought in the young lads, you know, the you know as we all know, the McPhails, the Kules, the Woodgates, the Robinsons. He brought the next generation through and he kind of let them go. He let them the reins go off a little bit and Howard didn't really let us do that. We played against Everton. I think we had four of us playing. We lost, I think two, one, I think we, we lost. I gave away a penalty. I remember that bit. Yeah. Um, but we, but that was kind of, we lost and he kind of not lost his bottle of playing us again, but he didn't play us all together again that yeah. often. Um, where if you look at Fergie and the, the young kids as Alan Hansen famously said, you never win anything with the kids. He let them come in and still let them breathe. But he had, he had the people around them, which were like your Steve Bruce's, your Pallisters. He still had, which helped Neville and and Neville. Then, you know, the midfield, but Skulls and and Beckham coming through. He still had your Roy Keane in there. He still had your your Cantona at that point coming through as well. So they still had their very experienced players in there, and he'd bring them in and out. He'd dip them in and out um, until he was fully, you know able to say, look, I can trust these 100 percent and they're my first team. It's Howard kind of lost, I think I think he lost a little bit of um because the results, because it's a results game and the and the results weren't going well. And and, and because the results weren't going well, he, he felt that he couldn't keep us in that team all the time, I suppose. Um because it's a pressure job and he, he you know he wanted to bring you know the people into that. So yeah, it's the the lads itself back in the in that day we as I say we've got a camaraderie between us now. You know, we I work on match days with with a lot of them from that era um, as well, and we just have we just laugh, you know, for the hour and a half, two hours we have there before the game. Um, or the, we've got an hour which is free. We, we're there generally four hours before the game, and you know we've got four hours of just having a good laugh with your mates, really, and that's that kind of just brings back memories from back in those days. Um, and stories come out and and stuff and yes we we'll class all ourselves as as really good friends and that I think that's that's the difference now with football to what it was then there's you don't really make that many friends in football but when you've got some success and things like that you you do make friends and um you know I'm really good friends with Tony Dorigo we we socialize outside of um outside of football and uh you know I'm meeting him in, I'm actually meeting him tomorrow as well so it's like it, that's the kind of thing which you'd never get nowadays. I think the players now coming through, it's very individualised. It's very much themselves a little bit. Um, and it's difficult. It, it, look, it's difficult for them to, to do what they're doing and, and, and stuff. So, But that's the modern game. But back then we had a camaraderie. We, we'd go away, we'd enjoy our night over stays and, you know, we'd be down in reception drinking tea and just having a laugh with each other. You know, it's um, you, you're never going to get that back really it's, but like luckily for me on a Saturday match days we kind of get that back because the only thing you miss from football is the changing room yeah uh, you mentioned Howard Wilkinson and he's a legend at Leeds what were it like playing under him I I liked it Um, you know other people didn't but I, I personally did I liked the way of his discipline I liked the way of, of how he was Um, you know for the only thing which you'd say about Howard was I think he was very much in front of his time back then. You know, we were doing things which you think that um, in a way are being done now. Um, and people looked at it and goes, it's a bit weird. Um, you know, back in ni- early 90s, it's very strange. <clears throat> but he had a way of playing and he knew how he wanted to play. 
And uh, if you did that, then he'd, he'd be loyal to you. And, you know, I, I liked um, I liked it because he gave me my chance, um, you know, and he, he, and he, he did look after me a little bit more maybe maybe than the others. I, you know, I can remember the, the cup final against um, Villa. I was, I was annoyed that I never played that game. Um, there was, I think that was the start of the demise of Howard at Leeds. Um, the team selection uh, being one of them, I, I was I was very annoyed that I wasn't involved in one way, shape, or form. Did he ever tell you? Why, what... Did he ever tell you why he wasn't involved? <laughs> no, you never got that from Howard. You never, oh. you never, you never got a, a come and have a chat with me kind of thing. You know, you might get Mick Hennigan having a chat with you, um, but you never get an arm around you and, and you know come into my office and let's have a chat about why you're not playing and, and so on and so forth. Um, I can remember I was left out of a squad once and. I'd been in the squad for like all season. I was left out of the squad. Never did I get a a answer to why that was. Mm. And I can remember going into, for instance, I can remember going into the canteen. The lads were all there. I had, I had all my suit with me. I had all my travelling kit with me on a Friday. They're all having their food and whatnot. And I'd say, good luck tomorrow, boys. I'm off. And I can remember Gary Speed just say, turning around and saying, why, where are you going? What, you're not in the squad? And I'm like, no, I don't know why I'm not in the squad. See you And there was a kind of, oh, oh right. Nobody really knew why. Um, but I, I, I got an angel getting a medal from the night from the um cup, uh, from the cup final. I got a medal because um, I played in a few games on the run up, and he got me into the office. Did Howard, and he just said to me, he said, "Look, I think you deserve this. Um, you've contributed quite a bit." So the run and uh, behind the scenes, everything else, we've got an extra medal here and. Uh, I think you deserve to have that. Now, I don't know if that was an apology for not being involved with the, in the cup final, to be honest, um, or what it was. But you know that it does. Even though it's a runners-up medal, it's it, it does. You know, I've got that medal. I've got the shirts and everything else, all all framed and things because I was involved through this. You know, I scored me um, me me first goal for Leeds. You know, in that run at Notts County. So you know, it was something which. Kind of thought, all right, okay, you know, I can maybe mix it a little bit easier, but I was, I wasn't happy, um, yeah. you know, not being involved in in that game. Um, and I, as I said before, I think that was the start of of Howard's tenure. Really, um, kind of, he, he kind of losing his way a little bit, um, you know. So, but look, he, he was still going strong. I think he's, I think it was his birthday the other day um, as well, so he's eighty. Um, you know, so he, he's still going strong. He was very much a person who was um, an innovator. He was in front of his time of what we did. Um, and I don't think we appreciated that at the time, uh, to be perfectly honest. But I think now you look back and you, you appreciate everything that Howard did, you know, not just for us as individuals and people um, and how we are, but also for how he, he transformed that, that football club around Um you know, to be the champions of, uh, you know, of England at the time. Yeah, you made a couple of appearances in the UEFA Cup. What was it like playing in Europe with Leeds? Uh, again, you can't beat European Knights. You can't beat Knights, just Knights, just generally down at Ellen Road, to to, to be honest. Um, you know, the, the Monaco game, obviously we went out to Monaco and, and Tony Boa scored three. Um you know, no, I think Noel played and we had five subs, but the pitch was absolutely horrific, was the pitch um, that night. And we were, you know, we were all concerned about the pitch. I think it had big holes in it from doing athletics on it or something like that. But, um, and then obviously they came back to, to our place. Um, and I think, yeah, I can't remember who was playing left back, but then the gaffer just shouted me and said, right, come on, you get, you, you're get going on. So I, I went on at left back against Monaco and got booked within the first 20 minutes, the first 10 minutes, I think it was. Um, of me coming on and and that was Thierry Henry going past me on the on the right hand side. I think I just dragged him down. <laughs> um, but they had a, they had a decent team. Obviously, we got through that, and then we went to uh, you know we had PSV then, um, and then Gary Speed got injured um, in that one, and he, I think he got injured after about fifteen twenty minutes again. So he came off, and I went on, and um, yeah, look, it's European nights are great, um, but they're only good if you win. And that's that's yeah. the bottom line. Um, you know, we talk. I talked to to Don Matteo about it a lot with with regards to the uh, you know European nights when when they were involved. And you know, yeah, it, 
they were fantastic nights and the atmospheres were unbelievable through them, you know, but you only, again, you only reflect on that when you've come out of it. Um, and he says the same, they're only good if you win. And, uh, you know, if you, if you come back from two nil down, three nil down and you, and you get a win, then brilliant. But, uh, unfortunately we went to PSV away. I got booked in the, in the second leg. So I wasn't, I didn't travel because I wasn't, um, uh, I wasn't uh, eligible because I'd been booked twice. And, um, you know, we got beat then, out there by the uh, by the real Ronaldo's we the original Ronaldo um we got beat by I think and uh but yeah look it's it again it's people forget that we were in Europe back then as, as well a little bit people only talk about Europe of, of that Champions Europe, League time you know when it, yeah and they, it, you know you kind of forget that we were in Europe at that time as well and the end of season trip where we because we went to um we played Tottenham and Brian Dean scored a, a worldie, to be fair to him. Um, ran from inside our own half and went through and, and we got into Europe that way. We got to like, I think we're, I think we finished fifth. I think we finished that season and uh, fifth or fourth. And um, we had a really good celebration. It was a very good celebration on the way home. Um, you know, we stopped off and got a whole lot of beer and all that kind of stuff because it was our last game of the season. So we had a, we had a real good jolly up on the way home and it was great that on a way trip that we've actually got into Europe and we're, we're on our way home and uh, it's a long journey basically. So we, we, the club are paying for a few beers for us all um, <laughs> on the bus and we, uh, we didn't realise it was, we got back and Nigel Worthington was, uh, was the instigator of it all. And we ended up coming off and we'd, he'd ripped Gary Kelly's shirt and Gaz Kelly had ripped his blazer and such and such had ripped it. So basically we all came off with hardly anything. We came into the ground and we, I think it was Bob, the, uh, the driver. And we just said, Bob, I think you need to carry on because there's a lot of cameras down there. And we ended up having to come a different way in to get some gear on to come off because all the all Yorkshire TV were there and everything else. And we're like, we can't come off like this. Um, but, but yeah, it was a very good trip back. And, you know, getting into Europe is is the rewards for that. And obviously the traveling, you know, to, to, to different, you know, different places. It didn't work when we, you know, when we played Rangers, it didn't work then. And we had obviously Stuttgart as well at that point. But, um, you know, it's... Uh, the Champions League is obviously what everybody wants to be in, and it's four or five games where you've got really good opposition, and you know, you know, Barcelona, our place, and you know, the AC Milan side of things. You kind of look at it and go, "We should never really have got out of that group, but we did, and we got to the semi-final." It was, and it should be talked about because it was a, a huge achievement. But the and the noise at them was unbelievable. But the, in our day, the the noise was just as good. Um, and European nights are something special, you know. The music and everything else is just a little bit, a little bit special, really. Uh, you mentioned you had a good start under George Graham, scoring in his first game in charge. Um, where did it go wrong for you then? Um, we played Arsenal away, um, and that was my last game, and I got dragged off at half time. Uh, we had basically nine man markers that game. And this was George really to a T. Rod Wallace on the way on the way to the ground got a phone call saying his wife was um, in hospital, so expecting a baby. So he jumped off. We had Ian Hart playing centre forward. Um, I'm unmarked. It was Patrick Vieira's first um, year in the Premiership. He'd only just come over, um, and I was my marking him. We got beat. I think three. I want to say three nil. No, I think we got beat. We got battered. Basically, we got absolutely battered. Um, and they were awesome. They were they were fantastic. And um, I can remember coming off, and I got dragged off at half time. And George, when I came, I got changed, showered, changed, came into the dugout, and George just kept on saying to me that this is how you should be playing. This is how we should be playing. This is how we should be. look. Look, watch it. Watch his movement there. Watch this, and it's all Arsenal. And you're just yeah. like, you kind of. I don't know if you can swear on this, but like you turn, yeah. around, you feel like turning around to him and tell him to fuck off. It's like this is Leeds United. You know, we 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 we're not wanting to. You know, we don't. We're not Arsenal. We we're not gonna. We don't want to be Arsenal. We want to be Leeds. We want to do what Leeds do. Yeah. And it, it did become very defensive and things. And that was my last game. I played. We we went to we went to Middlesbrough the next game away, and I was on the bench, and that was it for me. Um, I, I never played again. Um, and then I got to the end of the season. Um, I was in a situation where I could go for free abroad on a Bosman, which was something which excited me. Um. And George was basically the end of the season came and he he got me in um to the manager's dressing room 
and after training. And he just said to me, in no uncertain terms, he he started fully dressed. He ended up um, not fully dressed and going into the shower. So that's how I got told that I would never play for the football club again. I'd never train with the first team again. Um, I'd never be, I'd never play for the reserves. Um, and I'd be training on my own, basically. So about a five minute conversation. Um, and by the time he'd finished that conversation, he was getting in the shower. That's it. So off we go, um, kind of thing. And, um, so that, yeah, that was, but it, the final, the final words were, but you are at an age where we want some money for you. Um, so we have to offer you a contract and we have to offer a year's contract. So there's a year's contract extension um, just so you can't go for free, basically. So that that kind of put a bit of a scupper on on a few bits. Um, I wanted to go abroad and I'd, I'd very nearly signed for Osasuna, but then we realised they, they, they weren't paying the wages by all accounts. I went to Rapid Vienna um, on trial, which I would have gone there for free. Yeah. Um, from Leeds, so I, I went to Rapid Vienna and on trial again before our season started, and um, that was all sorted. Everything was done. Um, money was sorted. I've been to the house where I was moving into. I've been to see the car sales guy who you get your cars from, um, who sponsors the the club. So I've been to see all them on the on like I said Friday, and I was signing on the Saturday. Um, we're in the hotel room at night my girlfriend at the time and just said like you've got to go home do this 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 and this and sort all that out um woke up in the morning and they pulled the plug um literally in the morning so i i ended up back at, at leeds for pre-season um and uh we had a couple of uh offers in basically one being blackpool and nigel worthington was there and mervyn day was up at carlisle and yeah uh, george just said to me he said oh um we've accepted a bid from from blackpool go and speak to them I said, what about Carlisle? He said, oh, we accepted that age ago. I said, but go speak to Blackpool. I said, all right, fine. And I suppose maybe a little bit of my stubbornness at the time, but Mervyn was after me for a long time. And I went to both and Carlisle had, we had Roy Delap, We had Matt Janssen playing for them. Stefan Pudovacci from PSG playing for Moeen Archdeacon, and Warren Aspinall. Um, so we had a we had a really good team, Tony Keg in net. Um, so we had a really good team and, and the facilities were much better than Blackpool, but Blackpool had just lost to Bradford in the uh, playoffs. And we're in the same league. Um, so that you had experience in Blackpool or you had, you know, a, a relatively young squad working its way up, which is what Merv had, had kind of pushed me towards. And it was a very, t- it, it was a very tough decision to be, to be honest. And I, I ended up going um, up to, to Carlisle. Um, there was a rumour that Coventry were quite interested under Strack, but Strack was just said, he needs to be playing and he needs to, um, if he comes here, he's going to be very much the same as what it was at Leeds, where he's going to be in and out and, and a bit more of a squad player. And I did want to play and I did want to be involved in that sense. So, you know, I thought a step down to to try and get back up would be, you know, potentially the best move. And I went to Carlisle and, you know, unfortunately we had um, Mervyn got the sack after six games. Um and we had uh, Michael Knighton as our chairman, um, stroke manager, um, from pretty much that point onwards. So um, me and me and the chairman, um, stroke manager, didn't really get on, um, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And um, can't say too much. Um, but yeah, we we didn't get on um, at all. We believe that there's a, that I think there was a clause in my contract which nobody really knew about, apart from the clubs. Um, and the chairman's basically that if I played a certain amount of games, then they would uh, they'd owe more money. So I was dropped in certain areas and certain times and and things like that. And um, you know we had some manager come in. Nigel Pearson came in at one point. We had him come in. We had David Wilkes and and John Alpin, who were basically the youth team coaches under under him. So he was he was basically dictating you know quite a lot of what was going on in the teams and and that kind of stuff was the chairman. And um, yeah, we didn't get on. Um, Plain and simple. So that was that was the move which I ended up taking out of Leeds, which was a a big learning curve. Um, I think you you kind of don't realise, and I think these kids now don't realise how good they've got it at a real good big club as such, because everything's done for them. Yeah. Um, I can remember going to Carlisle for the first, on my first day. I was there early, and I got my training kit and everything else. And um, after training, I just came in. I threw it all on the floor, and somebody said, "What are you throwing it on the floor for?" I said, "Well, I'm sure there's somebody coming. They they clean it for you, don't they?" It's like, "No, you take it home and clean it yourself." I'm like, "All oh, right." So I shouted the first apprentice 
So I had my I had my boot boy and I, I shouted the my, my boot boy in and um I said, Come here, I said, Do you want to earn a few more quid? And he goes, What well, well yeah, what what doing what? I said, Well, do you want to clean my kit? And he goes, Yeah, I'll clean your kit, that's fine, yeah, I'll clean your kit. I says, Well, I'll clean my kit, there's all my kit, and just put it on my on my place every every day. Yeah, fine. I paid him paid him well as well for it. You know, I, I wasn't but like that was just something which if you went out on loan or you know, you weren't involved in a Premier League club. You kind of just, you just know that anyhow. But like, because you are so well looked after, yeah. you know, you kind of, uh, you kind of forget what it's like further down in the leagues. And this is the problem with a lot of, a lot of people in around football clubs. There's the young kid from Leeds now who's just, there's talk of him going to Man City. Isn't there? And yeah. I read yesterday he might be on 12 and a half grand a week. He's, he's 15 year old. It's like, let's go back to 30 quid a week. Let's go back and love it. Let's go back and, and, and be a footballer first and not look at what I've got here and look at what I've got here because you can get dragged into other things. You know, foremost, you want to be as a footballer. You enjoy playing football at 15 year old. It's not about money. It's not about how much money you've got. It's about enjoying the football and the process and everything which comes with it. And then if money and the fruits of that all come later on, it's easier to 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 cope with than what it would be if it was at a very young age. And, you know, the under-23s, I, I disagree with, because I think if you're 23 and you're not played any first-team football, then you shouldn't be at the football club, no, realistically. No. You're not, you know, if you're not good enough at 23, you know, you're not good enough. If you go back to our day, it, yeah, it's different. And I know that and we, we're scared of losing kids and we're scared of losing you know the good kid who turns 21 22 and suddenly goes grows and he's like he's an unbelievable player and, and so on I, I get that but if you're nowhere near the first team squad then you yourself I think has got to be you know thinking what what am I going to do um and like we were a, we, we were schoolboy well we were apprentices and from apprentices straight into reserve team football, first team football. So training with the first team, training with the reserves. If you weren't good enough, you you were released at 17, 18 year old. And that, that yes, it's ruthless. But then at least a lot of them lads can go off and if they're good enough, they'll get somewhere else. A bit like your, your Ian Wrights, for instance, and Jamie Vardy's and, and things like that. There's people who still do that. But I think that if you get to 21s, 23s, and you, you're nowhere near that first team squad and you're being fully fit all the way through, then I think it's like you you in your own head have got to think, right, what's my next move? Where am I going to go next? How that's going to work? Because, you know, dropping down is really difficult. Or you go out on loan, a bit like Joe Geldar did at Sunderland last, week, last year. Go out on loan. Go see what it's like at a, a, a championship club. Go see what it's like at a, a first division club, second division club. They're all different. Um, and you learn you learn then what that player's like. You know, David Beckham went to Preston. You know, they, he went to Preston for a bit with, under David Moyes at that time and uh, realised that maybe that actually I, I, I want to I want to be a pro football at Man United. Um, I don't want to go to Preston, you know, so it might give you that extra motivation to, to go on and do something. So it is, um, it's different now to what it was certainly back then. What do you think to a player like Gellar now? Do you think he should be on loan? Because he's not getting much game time at the minute, is he? I think the best place for Joe would be to go on loan. Um, you know, I think there's, I think, I think he's gone down the pecking order a little bit. Um, yeah. And especially at the minute with, with what we've got with, you know we've got we've got so much talent up top. It's frightening, um, and he must be thinking that himself. Um, I don't know what the conversations will be between him, his agent, and the club. For instance, what he wants to do. Um, you know, he's, he he signed a new contract. I think was it last year? He signed a five year contract last year. Yeah, I think. So. Um, you see what Greenwood's doing up at Middlesbrough. Yeah. Um he's playing really well. Uh, he, he's playing week in, week out as well, um, which will do him the world of good, you know. And that's the thing which you've got to kind of. That's the difficult thing you've got to get around in your head, you know. I, I do I need to leave a club where I don't want to leave um, to get first team football, and and who and what club that would be? Sure, God, has got oodles and oodles of talent, oodles of talent, um, you know, but. If you're not showing it in the first team, it's like it's kind of not wasted to a certain point, but somebody somewhere will will take him on. And I think, you know, him going out on loan would be or even a move away from the club. He might need that. He might need a full you know, new contract at a new club, 
you know, somebody come and buys him for a couple of million, three million, four million, whatever it would be nowadays to 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 take him. Because I think he is he is further down the pecking order than what he was this time last year. Um mm. you know, with with what you know Jorginho's doing, you've got Bamford behind that. You know what Perlo's doing in there. You've got Jorginho who can go into that place. You've got Bamford who can go into that place. You've got Nonto who can go in there. You've got Somerville who can go in there. Yeah. You know, you've got James who potentially can go in there. You've got Archie Gray who can play that for, that that more forward role as well. Um, you know, so the the the, the game time for Joe is going to get less and less, I think, and that's that's then time for him to think about what the next move is. Um, the club will obviously want him to stay because I think he's he's got a place for us this year. At some point, he's going to come in and, and be there. But if you're not in the squad when you've been involved, it's kind of quite disheartening. I've been there, and and you. Your first thought is, I want to play football, um, and I think he generally is one of those people who wants to play football. Yeah. He's not somebody who just wants to pick up his money and, and sit there. He's, he's somebody who actually does want to play football. But then it's very difficult. You get your chance, and you get twenty minutes here and twenty minutes there, fifteen minutes here. You, you, you just don't see it. a bit like you know. Look at Bamford at the minute; he's only getting 15, 20 minutes. But like I said earlier on, you know, the, the issue at the minute is we've got a team which is playing really good football and playing really well. Um, you know, and if if that's the case, and that carries on to the end of the season, nobody nobody really, as fans, we don't really think about the rest of the squad. We just want to win and get it back into the Premiership. Um, okay. The squad will be used at some point, you know, because we will have some injuries, which we which we've already had, um, you know, and that's once we've got that, it's these players need to come in and, and be wanting to to run. I, one thing which I think Fark's been fantastic at so far this this year and what he's done at Norwich as well is he, he, his man management skills are just unbelievable. Yeah. You know, to bring people back from, you know, certain things which was said and, and done and contracts which were in place at the start of the year to to where he's at now with, with the squad he's got. He's been absolutely fantastic. He's the best thing which... Which happened to Leeds from Bielsa for me. He's um, yeah. he he seems to get the club. He seems to get the fans. He seems to get what we want, and he seems to get this league. Um, and yes, we we always want more investment. And we always want more people, you know, more players to be in there and, and things. That's the that's the football merry-go-round, um, you know. But he seems to be at the minute managing it very very well. Well. Well, that Birmingham game at the start of the season, it didn't look good at that point, did it? He turned it around quite quick. So he has been... well, I think, well, I think the issue you had, we, we said this on the mics this, this weekend, the problem you had at the start of the season was we were so unsure of what we were having and, and who was going to be at the football club. You know, there was contracts put in place, you know, by Victor or by whoever, um, the, the, the old generation um, of chairmen and, and so on. You know, that that's by the by now. But he didn't know who was staying, who was going. Um didn't the chair, didn't the manager, and that's that's a real difficult situation to be in. And um, you know, we we've kind of given everybody a month start because the first month we didn't know if we had a player fit the next day, or they were going to turn around and say, actually, I don't want to play because I might get a move, or or what was happening. Um, and that was prime example on on transfer deadline day when Sinisteria went at the eleventh hour to you know to Bournemouth, and we get we get Anthony in, and it's like. Now we've got our settled squad. Now we've got what we want. Now the manager can work with his team. Um, you know, January is just around the corner, but, he, you know, we need to keep this squad together as long as, as, long as possible because I think this team and squad is is capable of, of going up this year, no problems whatsoever. You know, I know Leicester are flying or were flying. They've lost the last two. We showed a bit of, an, you know, an intent with to the league and to them, you know, with our performance and win. At, at their ground, um, you know we're we're on a run at the minute as well. Um, Ipswich, I think, I think they'll be there thereabouts at the end of the season. But I don't think they can keep this up. They seem to be going behind a lot and then coming through and, and winning. Yeah. Um, you know, I think you'll find that it'll be Leicester, us, and Southampton fighting it out at the end of the season. Which are the three teams which came came down last year? And um, I think all three will be very very tightly uh, you know bunched together um, but like, look we've just got to keep our run going we've, we've had we had a fantastic result against Leicester I thought on, on the Plymouth game we were I thought we were very very good for the first half I thought men against boys and I think we just eased off a little bit and uh, then 
typical leads do it the hard way of getting the, the <laughs> result at the end but you know we we got there in the end we've got an international break now so anybody who had little niggles will get fit again um and then we come back for the next game at uh, i think it's rather than next that we're, we're we're flying and um you know we it's a good month for us this month um you know the tough game being being middlesbrough um you know that'd be a, a tough one because they're on a bit of a run as well but look we can beat anybody. We, we're not frightened of anybody. And that, you know, we, we're making lead, you know, Ellen Road and Leeds United a fortress again. And that's what we want. And, you know, we want to make, make, make it to be um, people come to Leeds and they know what they're going to get. Um, they're going to get a lot of running they're going to have to do because we're going to have a lot of possession. And uh, if we can just take our chances, the amount we make, you know, 16 chances against Plymouth and we, we only had six on target. You know, 16 chances realistically, even if you had half of that, it should be eight. You know, we, we, we should be eight or ten of them should be on target, um, you know, for a ratio realistically. But you know, we people can't cope with us in, in you know going forward. The four the, the, the three or four what we've got up top are by far the best in the league. Oh and, yeah, um, yeah. And the other three which are on the bench are most likely the other best three in the league, to be perfectly honest. Um I would like to see Bamford play. Um I know a lot of fans maybe think wrong, but I think what Bamford does is he's comfortable in front of goal and he'll score his goals. Um, it's how he gets into this team. A bit like what we're saying about Joe Geldad. You know, he gets 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. He can't really stamp your authority on, in that time, really. But, you know, we're going to need Bamford at some point, you know, and we're going to need as a fan base to get behind Bamford at some point because he will score you 20 goals and he could still score you 20 goals this season because if he gets a run in this team, he will score goals. No no doubt about it, because we create so many chances that he think, will score goals. Do you think his confidence has just gone at the minute, like with that penalty at Stoke? Well, I think um is a if the strikers are confidence people, aren't they? That's that's what they that's what they thrive off. And I, I kind of I like that he wanted to take it because he wanted to get the you know, he wanted to get the goal to give him the confidence to go forward. I think look, I think he's a confident confident lad I don't think he needs any help on the confidence side of things um, he goes through fits and starts with goals He'll, he, you know once one comes along he normally gets two or three um, you know in succession so I think he's I think he's alright on that side of it I think he just needs game time um, but it's very difficult at the minute to knock on the manager's door to say I want game time I should be in front of him because realistically Nobody should be in front of anybody in that team at this present moment in time because we're playing some really good football, yeah. um, and that's 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 a great place to be for the manager because he's. But then he's got to man manage these players and he's got to man manage them through January. Um, at the end of January, if we've got the same squad as what we've got now, then I, I do firmly believe we'll um, you know we'll go up this year. Yeah, uh, just back to you. You played three games for the England under twenty ones. What was that experience like? Yeah, it was good. I was out in. I was out in the in in France um, at the Toulon tournament. Um, so from Leeds it was me and No Whelan. Um, so Snowy's a, a character to say the least. So I, I was sharing a room with Snowy, but he was ill most of the tournament. To be fair, he was in his bedroom quite a lot of it. So I actually spent quite a lot of time with Phil Neville and, and David Beckham at that point, and um, you know because they were in there and Andy Myers and um, and things. So we we had a we had a decent team. We got to the semi final. We lost against France in the semi final. Um, we played against Brazil in the first game and uh, yeah we were away for two two and a half weeks um, and it was it was great it's you know standing up there starting a game and you, you've got the national anthem going it's it's a fantastic thing and and being told that you've been you know you're in the squad to go um, again was was a great thing and I was I was on standby for a couple of squads as well um, but uh, yeah, the actual main squad I actually got into was was the Toulon tournament. So we went out there. I think it's quite, you know, the team which we had and the players we had. We we you look now realistically, we should have potentially done a bit better. But um, you know, we were all still breaking through at that point. And uh, yeah, look, it's people forget about you know in my career, people forget that I did play for the under twenty ones and. Um, you know, and it is something which I'm I'm proud of to say that I've, I've represented England. At, um, it's quite funny because I mentioned badminton earlier on, and as I said, I got told to, to stop playing football and play badminton. I played badminton for England. Um, well, I played football for England instead, and I named and shamed the 
the the coaches I had who told me to do that. Um, you know, when I when I did play for England in twenty one. But yeah, it, it was it was great. We met some friends there. Um, you know, some good friends we're still in touch with now. Um, you know, as well. Um, obviously Bex was went went off in a different angle, um, to say the least. Um, you know, he's uh we were both sponsored by Adidas and we, we, we kind of it was easier for us. Well, we actually got more stuff to be fair when we went together. So we always meet up and uh we met up down at um down at Adidas in Stockport every generally every two to three weeks and we'd go get a bag full of stuff. So if we went individually, we always got one. If we went together, we always got two or three. Um so we always go together. So we we kind of had a good re- good relationship, but then he, he he met um he met Posh and that was it. He he changed and um we played the game when we lost four note and Howard got the sack after we, we were all supposed to be going out then, but he, he actually said, look, I, I can't do it. Um, it was supposed to be me, him and Sharp are going out and he said, I can't do it. He said, I, the gaffer will go mentally if he sees me in, in central leads or something like that. So he actually canceled that. And that was pretty much the last time I, I, I spoke to him, but we, we, we spoke quite regular after the 21s and coming through yeah. because he made his debut. You mentioned the, the Man United game. He made his debut that day. Um, as well, so we've got quite a lot in common in in that way um, of how our careers kind of panned out. Under twenty ones, youth cup under twenty ones, his debut, my third game for Leeds at the time, and and so on. Obviously, he he um, he went on a slightly different path to me, um, to say the least. Um, you know, but I do remember the day when he he, he told uh, a few people. He told me that he'd, he'd met this 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 new girlfriend and stuff, and um, yeah, and it was posh spice. And you're thinking, all right, he's um, He's going down a slightly different route to uh, to a yeah. lot of people, but uh, yeah, look, he's he was a great lad. Yeah, I've got to say, he was a great lad, and and as was Phil Neville was a great lad. Um, I still see I still see scores in now at golf golf days again. Another great lad, and we all get on and we we all talk about the youth cup. We still talk about it now. You know, I, I saw scores last year at a golf event, and we were talking about it. We were talking about the youth cup. You know, because they'd never they've never experienced anything like that back then. Yeah, you yeah. know, and it was a big, big part of their lives as well. Um, but yeah, it's uh, the the twenty ones is a it's kind of a, a a stepping stone. Um, I think if you play for the under twenty ones now, you, you you're generally a, a first team player playing week in week out. I think again the game's changed on that side of it. Um, I've seen a couple of them have, have moved up into the uh, um, into the higher levels now as well. They've gone up into the uh, into the senior squads from the twenty ones, which is one heard of I've I've seen Archie's gone up to the to a different squad as well, you know, today. So um yeah, look, it's it, it is different. It's but under twenty one football, international football is 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 tough and it's it, you know, you learn again more, you know, from from that than than playing reserve team football basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, just a few quick questions uh, to finish off. Um, who was the best or toughest player that you played against in your career? Two, David Batty and Patrick Vieira. Really? Yeah. By, by, by far, you could never get anywhere near Bats. Um, Bats was just he was he was awesome at that shadowing kind of area, and, and he was so strong you just never got anywhere near him. Um, and when back to Leeds, he he kind of let. Your bowyers and 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 your other forward thinking players, your cures and so on, to to let him loose because you knew that he was behind you. Um, but Patrick Vieira was was by far the hardest, even if even for only forty five minutes, he was by far the hardest person. Um, John Lukic after the game came up to me and goes, "Cuz, don't worry about it." He says he's done that to everybody so far this year. This year, and he he did that for another however many years he was in the Premier League for. Um, he was he was he was. Unbelievable, really. But uh, they were the two toughest opponents. Who was the technically the best player that you played with? Technically, you got to say Gary Mack, I would say. Um, again, you could just give Gary the ball and he'll do something with it. Um, technically speaking, he was his range of passing and things was 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 brilliant. Um, but I've got to say, Matt Janssen was up there as well. Matt Janssen up at Carlisle was somebody who who had everything. Um, you know, he his touch, his vision, his his finishing skills, his left foot was was right up there. To be fair to him, um, you know, he was he was very good. But certainly, I think you know from Leeds's point of view, Gary Mack was was by far the um, the most technically gifted player I played with down there. 
Uh, I don't think you're going to say Old Trafford for this one, but what was your favourite ground that you played at? It's Ellen Road, isn't it? It's you know that's where you want to play. It's where you, it's where you grow up watching football. You know you you go from the stands watching it from the cop. You know coming into you know it's your boyhood club and and everything else. You know there's no better feeling than walking out. Um, you know to the music at uh, before the game or or going out there and, and warming up and and things like that. You know and I don't think you can beat any any other club, any other team. It just doesn't have the same atmosphere to me than than what Ellen Road does. Um. It's it's a special place. I think it's a special place for a lot of lot of people, a lot for a lot of different reasons. I think you know players always come back and say the same thing, and and you know it's one of them things which it gets you does leads. It, it gets you in the it gets you in the heart, and once it's got you, it's got you. And I said this to to somebody the other week and on stage, and it is very much like that. You know, it's it grabs you, um, and Bielsa grabbed it. Bielsa knew it. He worked yeah. on it. Um, and I think Fark is doing the same thing. I think he gets it. I think this group of players gets it as well. Um, Clicky, Click got it straight away, hundred percent. He got it. Um, yeah. he knew what the club was about. He knew what it was all all going on and everything else. And I think so. I think you know you look at it in that way. I think Leeds Leeds itself and and the club and the facilities and you know the the fans and everything about it is it is by far for me the best. Um, you know, place and I'm very, very fortunate that I work there on match days and, you know, get to experience it, you know, on a weekly basis. Um from slightly behind the scenes as well, which is great. It's um, it's a fantastic place. You still get goosebumps when you walk into the changing rooms. Um, you know, you talk about your time there and you you know, you you sat there and it's changed obviously a lot since since we were there. But yeah, it, it just grabs you and once it's got you, it's it's hard to let go, unfortunately. Or fortunately, depends how you look at it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so my last question is you've mentioned that you're still working at Ellen Road. So what are you up to nowadays? So I'm I'm now a host. I'm a I, I've got a so I do a bit of personal training. I came out of fleet, I came out of football and did personal training. I, I had an IV company which I, I I had um you know, so which I've got a share in that uh, now still. And I've got um I work at Ellen Road on, on the hosting side of it and the ex-pro side of things. And I do hosting outside, so I'll do the interviewing of, of the lads or um, host your evening for you or whatever it will be, really. So presentation nights, auctions, that kind of stuff. So we go out and do do quite a lot of that. Um, a lot is golf-based on that side of it, but then obviously the, the lead stuff we do with the ex-pros, with, with Steve Hodge, Mel Sterling, John Newsom, um, Neil Aspin, Bobby Davison. So, you know, we, we have a good array of players who, who come into there. Um, there's... Matt Kilgallen's in there as well, and and and, uh, and stuff. So there's there's a lot of the lads who come in, and, and we just have a laugh basically. But we go on to stage in all the corporate areas. We talk to the the players. Um, I will host that. Um, you know, and we'll talk about the game, and we'll talk about what needs to be done or what needs to be changed. Or, and I think I look at it in a slightly different way, being in the shoes of of the players instead of being. You know, some hosts, uh, obviously the fans are hosts, uh, you know, to a certain point, but like they might see it in a different way to what I do. And, you know, yeah, I, I kind of try and push them a little bit on the technical side of it a little bit and a bit more of, of what might be happening, lead them into a, a little bit of a question of what could be happening in the changing room at half time and, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, host, host the events down there and, you know, match days, we take the match sponsors around the pitch, we go into the changing rooms, we go to the press offices and all that kind of stuff, which... um you know, second nature to us, but you know, when when you see the face of some of some grown men going into the change rooms, into dugouts, onto the pitch, and all that kind of stuff, it's uh, it kind of uh, makes it very satisfying that you know you're involved in that in one way, shape, or form. So yeah, it's uh, it's a good job to be being. Um, I enjoy it. I've been there for now eight or nine years, so I've been through the I've been through the Chilino days, I've been <laughs> through the Hockey Day days, I've been through the Steve Evans days, I've been through. All of that. Um, I've been through when we only had four and a half thousand there at uh, four five thousand. I think it was at um, Notts County or something like that on a Wednesday night in the cup game, and you know, and you're kind of coming in. There's only two tables in the corporates, and to now in the Premier League when we had, you know, we've got you know over a thousand people in in the pavilion, and we've got you know three or four hundred people in each of the corporate areas which we're talking to now, which is it's just a great buzz around the football club at the minute. Um, I think last year it might be a I don't want to say a blessing going down, um, but I think you know we we needed to re 
boot everything. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the chairman kind of, I think he did let us down a little bit. Um, but then they threw a load of money at, at Christmas and it just didn't work. Um, you know, but now, you know, I think that change and that that going down has kind of re- revitalised every every part of the football club. And I think that now, you know, we, we are on the right track and I think we'll be stronger for going down to, if we do go straight back up, I think we'll be stronger for it as well. Um, and I think if we give Daniel Farker the... Uh, the money like he didn't get at Norwich, I think he'll he'll be able to then move us forward a little bit more as well um, on that side of it. So, you know, yeah, look, it's exciting times down at Leeds at the minute. It's very, very exciting that we're, we're playing some good, attractive football and, you know, we just need to keep that going now to, to the end of the season. I think we'll be, uh, I think we'll be back in the promised land then and back with VAR and all that kind of crap which you've got to deal with um, in the Premiership to be perfectly honest it's quite nice this year isn't it when you, you go in and you can there's a goal and you just cheer and yeah, exactly. you don't have to think about VAR you don't yeah. have to think about anything else you know going back four stages or something <laughs> um, you know but uh, look it's it, it's good at the minute there's a great atmosphere around the football club um, the players are all they all seem to be together um, which is the number one thing and um, you know which is great after the uh, after that first couple of months of, of being back in the club and, you know, the start of the season with not knowing what contracts were, were doing and stuff. And, you know, now it's a, it's a time of, uh, for them all to, you know, to stick together, um, you know, have a good time, enjoy it, enjoy this, the, the winning mentality, which we've, which we seems to have um, and enjoy, you know, even more keeping clean sheets if we keep clean sheets, we win football matches because we'll always score goals. Um, exactly, yeah. And that's our that's that's our biggest bugbear at the minute has been ex-pros is that we're just letting in, a, you know, the goal the other week and the goal against Plymouth that we we just letting them in when we don't really need to the Huddersfield goal and that will be as a defender or as a a keeper you'll be absolutely fuming even though you've got your three points. So you know if we can just tighten up there a little bit, then we're um, yeah I think we I don't think we'll be far off to be perfectly honest. I think we've massively improved defensively though over the last couple of years. So yeah, like- I think I, I think we have, and I think we've got choices in there as well. You know, I think um, I think when you look at it at the minute, Byron when when Byron came in, I think people were very much on the lines of, you know, what, will he do it? Will he not? You know, as long as he he keeps injury free, he's been a revelation um, at left back. To be honest, I do think Furpo will. He should be great in this league. Um, he, again, another one who just needs. Game time. You look at Pascal; he's he's flying um, this year, and I think he's come on leaps and bounds um, yeah. this year with having potentially having somebody next to him who talks to him a lot and kind of still moves him. But also, when Pascal gets it, his first thought now is to go forward. His first thought not is to go sideways or or backwards. His first thought is a bit like Rodon; is it's into that space and let's let's go into that space. You know, which you can see is a, a Daniel Fack kind of, um, you know, kind of thing he wants to do. So, you know, look, he's he's coming on leaps and bounds, and you know, let's hope he's back pretty quick after his hernia up. I don't think it'd be too long. Um, it's been well timed, obviously, with the international break and everything else. Um, you know, so but yeah, we need him back into the, into the team as quick as possible. But we, you know, yeah, we we we're gonna be as I said before, we're gonna be there thereabouts this year. Yeah, definitely, I think so. Well, uh, thank you for coming on. I enjoyed that. Uh, no problems. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll see you in a bit. No worries. Thank Cheers, you. mate. Thank you. Cheers, Bye. pal.